Hello to all of you out there looking at the channel at the moment, or watching the channel rather. Uh, we have a kind of relatively new segment we're going to be doing on a monthly basis where us at Razor Thorn, the consulting team, pen testing team, will have various different people, uh, no doubt over time, kind of joining on and being part of the conversation. Um, at the moment, we've got Tom, Michael, and Jamie. Um, we're going to be discussing current events, current news, points of interest that have occurred in the last month or so. Guys, what do you, uh, what, should, what should we start with? Where are we, where are we, where should we begin? I don't know. I think the, um, I think the ransomware one is, for me, it's probably the most interesting one. So, um, what was it? it was an, you linked it on, you put it on your LinkedIn, Jim, didn't you? So, um, it was a link to the Telegraph, um, and it says that it is uh, it was last Thursday, Thursday evening. So we saw it Friday morning. Um, that com- companies are being banned from paying hackers after recent attacks on Royal Mail and Guardian. So um, yeah, the foreign secretary has basically state that the sanctions on seven Russian hackers linked to a gang called Conti. And I think some of you are probably aware of that. Um, yeah, they've been, because of the sanctions, they're no longer allowed to pay ransomware to that group. I mean, my first question, and I put it in my, my LinkedIn post, really, comes down to the fact that we, we know a lot of these groups are highly kind of compartmentalised. There's subgroups, affiliates, that kind of thing. So any payment made to, say, an affiliate that had undertaken this some of that money could eventually walking its way through the various different subgroups find its way to those those particular individuals and there's no way to really tell who's doing what i mean i find it it's, it's an interesting piece of of literature um I, i'd be interested to see the the you know how this one plays out i, I can't see how they're going to determine that I think it's going to be interesting, Jim, because um, at the moment I don't think they've actually speci- um, specified whether it's going to be purely public sector or national related services that are going to be subject to this um, this ban, this legislation. Um, it's also going to be incredibly hard to police. Um, one thing I think it does do, though, is um, this hike in cyber insurance premiums, especially for ransomware payouts, it will start plateauing that rise um, because where organisations, whether it be public, private sector organisations, um, have that level of legislation in place where they're not able to pay ransomware if they are subject to it, then you know, I mean, there's going to be no expectation on insurers to, to pay out for it. So it mm. reduces the amount of risk. Um, from a, a premium perspective, from an insurer perspective, that they will have to pay out for these these big players who are the the main ransomware uh, players w- within this circuit. Um, but equally, it puts the the footing on the organisations, whether it be small medium enterprises or or the bigger bigger fish like uh, post office. Um, it, it puts more emphasis on them to to actually invest in their information security controls to make sure that any risks are taken down to residual risk only and they're not just blindly accepting risk, which is then opening their doors to to basic breaches and, and then ransomware attacks. Yeah, just to clarify something there, it was actually Royal Mail, not not the post office. They're two separate separate estates. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm sure we'll get on to this um, fairly shortly, but um, about whether this is indicative of actually the government making a move to um, make ransomware payments illegal across the board, but even this on its own, I mean, as as you said, Jim, is that there are a lot of groups out there all doing this. Um, who's, to, who's to say what what group leads back to other group, whether it's Russian or not? Um, I, th- I, I feel that the insurance companies are going to take this opportunity to pretty much turn around and say, unless you prove that it isn't going back to Conti or vice versa, then we're not going to pay out. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of things really here that concern me. First of all, I mean, if they do a blanket ban on paying 
the ransom for ransomware. First off, there's the whole ethical, is it right, is it wrong? Second thing is, if they ban it, then, you know, you're going to get automatically, you know, your data is automatically going to get leaked out. Um, I suppose third point is, is will ransomware groups then go off to, to, to other pastures rather than attacking UK-based companies? You know, organisations that aren't under the same rule set. But then, I don't know. I mean, this it's, it's such a controversial... Well, ransomware is very effective. Even if they don't get a payout, they can always, uh, you know, it's effective and it's and it's insidious and it can actually get in, uh, you know, into a business. And even if they don't, even if they don't get the payouts from the UK businesses or British businesses that are being told that they can't pay out, then, you know, they are still able to take that data and sell it on the black market. So it's not really going to stop that side of it. I don't know whether we should explain. I think most people are aware of ransomware, but ransomware is obviously kind of like a two step, well, not even two stages, it's two parallel attacks. One part of it is that they lock up your systems, they encrypt your data and everything else like that. And it means that you can't, um, that you can't, access and continue doing business that's one side and that's the bit that they turn around and say pay us and we will unlock it for you the as the second part of that obviously is that they've got taken your data they've exfiltrated their data or could have exfiltrated your data and they also ransom you and say right if you don't pay us then we will release it on the dark web we'll sell it we'll whatever the case may be so there's two aspects to this this ban as at least at the moment on Conti, that hacker group, is only going to really potentially stop one one of those sides of attack. So I still think British businesses will be targeted. They'll I just think the main the issue they've done at the moment. Well, the, the main thing they'll do is rebrand, revolt, because they they they've all they've done is put a ban on Conti and the affiliated subservices that are conducting these types of attacks. Um, now in real time. The only way that you can identify if they are related is by doing that in-depth analysis of where, where that network traffic is coming in, like obviously like identifying and um, analysing IP address and stuff like that. But that requires a mass intelligence database to be able to reach into to, to compare your, your network traffic. Um, now that, to my knowledge, doesn't exist. Certainly one that the commercial world can't dip into at a moment's notice as an immediate action, uh, reaction to being subject to ransomware. So all they've got to do is rebrand. Or just use independent brokers that can't yeah. necessarily be traced back to them. I mean, So they're still going to yeah. be using the same tactics, they're still going to be using the same algorithms, the same programming, but they just won't be identifiable as Conti. So there's the very simple loophole. So and, that, and that's one of the, in my mind, one of the main failings of this legislation is, yeah, they're they're obviously condoning ransomware attacks and they, they don't want it to happen, but they're only doing it to one explicit organisation, which you can't necessarily prove. I reckon I'll expand it. You know? Yeah, that was going to be um, my next question is, do you think this is indicative of the UK government actually taking a stance here and pushing what? out, you know, broad, worldwide, uh, well, not worldwide, but UK-wide, British-wide, saying that you can no longer pay ransom? I, th I just think it's knee-jerk. I think it's a knee-jerk reaction from, uh, you know, on, a, on an official level because they felt that they had to say something and do something about it. But they, they, they obviously really didn't think about it or they did, didn't speak to somebody in the, in the intelligence industry, the cybersecurity intelligence industry, about, you know, how they were going to do this. Because, I mean, they, they, they have specifically named individuals there. We have no idea who those guys are. We don't know what the handles are. I mean, you know, maybe some of the uh, security intelligence people will. But who's to say they don't have multiple handles? Who's to say they're not in multiple groups? You know, uh, I just don't... I, ju I just think it, a, a bit more thought needs to be put into this. I mean, and, and are they doing it because of ransomware? Or are they doing it because... Uh, they see it as as meeting the sanctions against Russia for what is happening in that neck of the neck of the woods. 
Personally, I think, yeah, you're right. So it's, 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 it's going to be busy, big businesses shouting and screaming and they've done a knee-jerk reaction, but they've slipped it under the banner of this also conforms to the sanctions that we've got in place. There, yeah, definitely. There needs to be a lot more, a lot more thought process needs to be put into this. And if they're going to take that step, I've, are they going I, to I think get they it to, done? They need, to, they need to see what the fallout of this legislation is going to be. Uh, like you say, Jim, I think this is very knee jerk because they need to be seen that they're doing something or that they are taking a specific stance on it. And, and obviously um, condoning uh, Conti and, um, and going down the process they have already. You know what I mean? It's a step. How big a step? It's yet to be seen yet. Um, but in terms of building on it, yes, absolutely right. I think they will build on it um, to eventually, obviously, you can't blanket it. Um, ban payments on ransomware you can't blanket it because then that completely takes away uh, the ability of a business um, to enact any kind of business continuity uh, if a business is going to go under after three days of systems being down the business is going to go under and if if it's within their appetite to pay a ransomware payment within an accepted amount they're going to pay it to maintain business as usual it's, it's, that, it's their business right to, to make that decision and take on that risk appetite. Um, but I mean, hypothetically, if, if, if you've got a, a ransomware organization that goes for one big fish that locks, locks up their system for, for a million pounds, but if they're a condoned entity, the legislation states that you cannot pay that ransomware, then number one, yes, you're not likely to pay it. Um, but obviously the ransomware attackers are not likely to get it. But if they, attacked and approached a hundred small medium enterprises at ten thousand pounds each what's the highest percentage of them actually going to pay it just because it's within their bounds it's within their budget it's within their their risk appetite yeah you know i mean these the ransomware attackers are at least going to make 60 70 maybe even 80 percent of those ransomware payouts they've got a guaranteed return but don't you think that's more to stop their motivation right you get all these ransomware groups and don't you think putting this law in place will well, I wouldn't say we'll stop it, but it could, you know, at least stop some of them and their motivations to actually. It, it's, it's going to put small and medium sized enterprises more at risk because the, the bigger players at the moment, the bigger, large organizations, they're the main ones that have got the capital to pay out these big ransomware payouts or that they've got cyber liability insurance or ransomware insurance um, that would cover them, obviously, depending on the, um, the prohibition of, of paying out to certain groups, it's covered. Um, but I think all it's going to do is switch fire. So rather than going for the big fish, the big merlins, they're just going to go for the smaller fish. Again, that might still be able to weather a storm of paying out 10, 20,000 pounds for a ransomware attack to unlock your system. And the output is still the same. They're still getting a similar, if not the same uh, amount of ransomware payouts. It's a little bit more effort, but effort versus reward. Don't look past the possibility of them using it as a PR exercise to show that they're not mucking around, you know, um, by purposefully going for specific companies that, that, that become compromised by the access brokers and them saying, right, let's, let's, let's show what happens if somebody makes a silly, a silly, you know, legal require, you know, legal uh, law such as this. Because I mean, the UK is just the UK. There's a ton of other com you know countries out there, and unless there's a blanket ban, which there isn't going to be, because I mean, half the time we can't even agree what we're going to do about climate change, let alone something as universal as as ransomware. So I don't see how this one's going to get resolved. I don't. I don't see what the point is I, I mean if they did a black if they did a blanket ban across all ransomware then we'd be discussing whether or not that's appropriate what you know whether or not you're you, you know you, you should be doing that <clears throat> you know the narrative is different well i mean then let's let's in in our experience then maybe we should just ask the questions flat out is this a first step is this indicative of the UK government finally putting a blanket ban on all ransomware payments? It's a tough question. I know it's tough. At this early stage, I think it's tough.
what do you reckon? Dip of dip of the foot to see whether it works, and then expand upon it. I mean, the UK government are very good at putting little laws in. I'll be honest. Love you, the UK government, by the way. In case you're watching this, <laughs> putting little laws in, waiting for the, that to get accepted, and then expanding them beyond what the original, you know, what the original kind of write up on it was. I mean, did you yeah, see what ways are created by it? Um, and and also, what what what's the turnout if if an organisation pays a ransomware? for example, because this is obviously the one we're talking about, but an organization gets hit by Conti tomorrow. Organizations within their risk appetite and their, their financial scope to pay the ransom. So they pay it, it unlocks their systems. But then what's the um, what's the fallout from a UK government perspective in reparations on that? The business is maintaining business continuity. It's, it's enacted its business continuity and disaster recovery uh, policy to obviously ensure minimum business uh, minimum impact to business as usual. But what's the fallout from that? Because they've, by very intention, they've broken the law. Yeah. Well, this this sanction itself is dangerous in itself to every business out there in that, uh, currently in the UK, because if they are, if they are targeted directly by Conti, then they can't pay. So they are going to have to deal with... So even this is starting the ball rolling, the snowball rolling down the hill, gathering speed, gathering more snow and everything else like that in the way that, um, you know, any business out there currently, right this second, if they are targeted by Conti and it's proved that it's Conti, yes, there may be some time to pivot and everything else like that as we've discussed but they can't pay. So they're going to have to react to that and they're going to have to protect themselves against ransomware more now. I think it's it's one of those things that people should act sooner on this rather than later because who's to say that sanction ever gets removed? It may not. And if Conti continues to be a player in this space, which they obviously are and quite a big player, especially targeting people like the Royal Mail and the Guardian... If they're, if they're going to continue to play in this space, then businesses right now in the UK need to act. That's how I see it. It, it, it puts more emphasis on organisations to adopt proactive solutions rather than reactive. I yeah. mean, Uber, last year, I think it was, obviously when they had their breach, um, literally, I think six hours later, they had uh, regional CISO role adverts live on LinkedIn to, to try and fill the gap. Uh, because they suddenly realised that, oh, we need to do something about this information security perspective to protect ourselves because something has gone wrong. Now, the majority of organisations out there, they are adopting certain security postures or cyber security postures or searching for um, cyber solutions based on a breach because they've suffered some kind of uh, attack, a leak, data leak, whether it be internal or external. Um, and it's that mind shift of getting organizations to be reactive or proactive with their solution management and their cybersecurity rather than reactive. And it is, it's a good step. Um, is it trying to force something down the throat of organizations? Yeah, I think there's an element of that, but we, certainly the, the government and um, wider organizations, they're moving across to a secure by design um, methodology now. So any tool, any framework that they either utilize as a third party or or even within their own systems, it has to be secure by design. So not secure by afterthought, by bolting on a, a solution just to, to tick a box. And I, I do, I, th I think it's the, the government's way of trying to funnel um, the country down to a secure by design principle methodology moving forwards. Yeah, because this, 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 uh, this, this literal announcement has removed a safety net. In certain circumstances, I mean, it, at the moment it's Conti, you know, and everything else like that, but this removes a safety net. That business is absolutely, you know, any of those businesses that are targeted by Conti are absolutely stuffed in the nicest word. I was trying to come up with a, nicest word, a, a, a nice word, but are completely stuffed because they've got no recourse. That safety net is now gone. You've always, with ransomware, you've always got the safety net of, okay, we push it, we push it, we push it, we can't recover, we can't recover, pay them. And then that's why there's normally a timeline uh, or a time frame for these ransom, uh, these ransoms. But 
that safety net is completely gone now. So people need to, are going to have to react to that. React but to then that. does that put the hand of God in organisations like Conti? So if, if you come under the crosshairs of Conti, hypothetically, that's business end. That is yeah. the end of your organisation. That's the end of your business because you can't do anything about it. Yeah. But the big, big problem there is you, you won't know until you've already been done. Exactly. So and people need to act. This is what I'm saying. People need to act now. Pardon me for being a little bit on the cynical side, but, you know, in, in, the, 20, in the 25 years that I've been here, we don't spend enough on security at the best of times. Um, and the only time secure, you know, money really is spent on security is when there's a compliance obligation or a requirement to do so due to, you know, wanting a specific type of business. Occasionally, it's because people think it's a good idea. I won't, I won't take that away from from organisations, but but more often than not, there's a business need for doing it, or they've suffered a breach. I mean, you know, the best way to defeat exfiltration of your data is obviously using some, you know, one of the best ways, is, there's a few, is using encryption. Um, but encryption products where, you know, you're not tying in the encrypt decryption key for the data in with your access. Active Directory or whatever, yeah. No, I mean, this is what I was going to say. I mean, we've talked about this now. It's expensive. And we've mentioned, yeah, and we've mentioned things in the past in other videos. I know you especially have, Jim, uh, about ransomware, and we've done a number of videos of ransomware. But I suppose let's pivot this now, this conversation, into what's the minimum that people should be looking at to do? Well, that's, that's exactly what they shouldn't be looking at it like. And, and, then, and unfortunately, that's something you hear time and time again. Well, you not know, the minimum, I, but I mean, yeah. The pragmatic <laughs> approach is what I get yeah. I get told and said a lot too, which normally means we don't want to spend anything. Um, I think, you know, it's different depending upon the type of company. It depends on your assets. You know, this is why you have, hopefully, an information security professional at hand or you have one on staff or you have an organization that you deal with because you, you need to look objectively at, your organization, what it does, its assets, and, it, and what defense in depth measures it's got now, before you can even just figure out kind of what you need in order to protect yourself. You know, is it a database? Is it, is it individual files? Are you worried about email being stolen? Because, I mean, that's what happened with Sony. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily ransom, uh, you know, like a, a ransom piece that happened to them, but somebody hacked in and nobbled all their, their emails where various different people were criticizing you know high profile individuals and then just releasing them out on the internet um i weirdly enough we were i, I just recorded a podcast on legislation uh, a little bit earlier with with a couple of guys a couple of guests and there's no seemingly way i mean <sighs> Cyber Essentials is not exactly going to protect you from this kind of this kind of issue, is it? Let's face it. If you follow Cyber Essentials, it, the, the, there's nothing in the Cyber Essentials requirements that's going to protect your organization from a ransomware attack. I'm sorry for, for all of you out there that might be thinking, oh, but, you know, it's a cybersecurity requirement. It's, it's just not up to scratch for this kind of level of attack. Um. I don't know. I, it's it's a really it's such a convoluted subject matter, and it's so sort of different from company to company. I'd I'd need to go in. I mean, any organisation saying protect us from ransomware, I'd have to go in. I'd have to go in, see what they've got, how they're working what their incident response is like, what the backup's like. Up, what their critical assets are that they can't do without, that if it was encrypted, ransomed. Yeah, I know. I completely get that. But there's, I still... Companies won't spend the money unless they see a need to. And if they see a clear and present threat, then they'll spend that money. You know? Do you not see this as a clear and present threat? That safety net has just been ripped out. 
I know there are certain circumstances that it has to be Conti and everything else like that. But this set of, but around around a piece of ransomware in a specific, fairly specific scenario, there is no longer a safety net for. I see it as a change in risk, you know, in your risk modelling when it comes to assessing the risks that you have against ransomware. When you're looking at your probable loss, your prob, your, you know, either your probable loss or your your worst case scenario, it's always going to be worst case scenario, because your probable loss scenario is pretty much going to be redundant at that point by by the nature of the way that attack is. So, you know, if your data set is worth, I don't know, ten million to you, the moment you get ransomware by by a, you know, group associated with the one of the people on the ban list, that's it. You're done. 10 million or however much you've 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 calculated um and recovery costs well you can't recover your your reputation not anytime soon we've all seen that i mean look at talk talk it took them years and years and hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars in um marketing and damage control so I mean, in an ideal world, everybody would look objectively at their organization and go, right, where are my risks? Where are my single points of failure? You know, undertake their own kind of risk assessment of their security posture and would have spent an appropriate level of money protecting themselves from, you know, the worst case scenarios and and the worst risks, but they don't do it. But this is where CTI is going to come into play with the, the new version of 27001. And it'd be really interesting to see how many organisations either list or do not list that in their statement of applicability. If it's not forced on them to do it, they won't do it. But by whom? Well... It's down to the organisation to, to dictate um, whether something's within scope or not. And if they see, oh, well, we've got no use for CTI, then and they can put in a dare I say, a half assed attempt to justify it that the, the auditor is willing to accept, you know what I mean? Then it's it's not within scope. I mean, you, I, and Jay, and, and everyone in his dog knows that it's practical to it, to incorporate CTI, especially within the new landscape, with the new risk, with the new um, threat intelligence streams that are out there, and specifically all the databases that are available for suitably trained CTI individuals. I mean, the, the world's a, their oyster. Um, and it's obviously down to the level of competence and training that individuals had. But if the organisation dictates or decides CTI isn't within scope, we're not going to put it on our statement of applicability, then that can be um, considered, obviously, during the audit. And if the audit goes, yeah, all right, you give me adequate justification, then it's bypassed. Yeah, Two months later, they're then subject to a ransomware. I suppose then the only other option is to, is to defang the most likely the most likely issue that you're going to experience in that kind of attack, rather than protecting yourself from everything, you know, make sure your backup solution is working and stick on some encryption onto your on your sensitive data. This is where you go back to your data classification. You work out a level that you feel uncomfortable anybody getting hold of information from, and then you just encrypt everything and, and feasibly encrypt your emails as well, just in case somebody wants to you know, find a, a dodgy email that you sent, you know, somebody's secretary or somebody's secretary sent you. I mean, every business is different, but and I agree with you on this. I just think that what I think what we would like to, I think what we're aiming to do here on at least on this kind of like um, call is to provide at least some guidance to businesses for these kind of like emerging threats and everything else like that, um, yes, it would be ideal that there is a, a um, you know, a cyber um, person, an experienced cyber personnel within their business who can advise because they have the insight knowledge of what are the critical assets and things like that and what the best steps would be. But for those that don't have information security professionals within their business or they don't necessarily have... Um, you know, a company that they can rely on to provide that. What are we advising people to do? I mean, that's why we're consultants. Why are we? What do we? What do we advise people to do? I mean, Jim, you've mentioned obviously that you know something, some form of encryption. Ideally, 
the best form of encryption is to not have it linked to any form of access control, uh, um, Active Directory or whatever the case may be. Um, so encryption's one. Backups, again, backups, any backup would be good, but again, ideally, it would be remote, secure backups separate from the network and everything else like that that they can draw back in. What else are we talking about? Multi-factor authentication? No, that NFA is, is all right, but it's, it's not necessarily the be-all, end-all. Um, yes, it's a layer um, that can be incorporated within defense in-depth methodology. Well, um, I mean, uh, multi-factor authentication would take away um, the required, uh, some of the requirement, not all, because you obviously you want to layer security um, solutions and controls, but would take away some of the requirement for having encryption unassociated with your access control. So if you had MFA and then mm. just general encryption. I, don't know, we, I we, know, I know, I'm being very, very kind of broad and generalist here, but... You know. We have a pen. We have a pen tester here. Will show you quite adequately what you know, what level of access you can get without having access to. to, to I know. I'm simplifying things, but I still think that you know, if we're going to give businesses some advice, what? Ad okay, I'll open it up. What advice should we be giving them? If they could, if there are businesses out there being potentially targeted by Conti. I don't backups. You know, backups and encryption. Backups. I, I, that's where I would go. Uh, isolated backups that are not permanently connected to your network infrastructure. Yeah, as soon as it's permanently support. aligned, exactly. Um, yeah. Whether it be um, disk backups that are done on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis, what whatever schedule um, an organisation deems fit within their risk appetite, then they should be obviously backed up and then stored in a safe, controlled, access controlled environment um, that should they be subject to any kind of breach, DDoS, ransomware, that they can literally do a factory reset of their system and then rebuild. Yeah, and there's also educating employees as well. So they're obviously the weakest link throughout all of you know their security posture. So educating your employees making them as knowledgeable as possible about social engineering attacks, vishing, phishing, et cetera, would be a huge step forwards. Phishing campaigns can highlight, and again, it's not about the malicious actor, but it's about the um, the unaware, the uneducated um, insider threat through accidentally clicking on uh, an email. You know I mean, we all get emails sometimes, well, hopefully most of the time they're legitimate, but sometimes like the odd one even no matter what email security solution you got in place, you will get some slip through the net and all it takes is that one click. So running phishing campaigns can, can actually highlight those that are at increased risk and susceptible to click those one, one in a hundred, one, one in a thousand emails that make it through the net. These are so effective as an attack that they are used constantly <laughs> on firms of all different sizes because they're so difficult to to deal with you know and by the time you figure out you've got a problem it's already too late so yeah preempt but i mean you've got to convince a c-suite an it department a security person potentially with quite limited budget to undertake uh, a security program and and i'll be honest the encryption of large swaths of, of just data alone is a risky process because if that goes wrong, if that process goes wrong, you wind up with a bunch of data that's all corrupted and you can't access it. Not to mention the problems you'll have, depending upon the type of um, encryption you have, on educating your users, dare I say it, some of your older and less used to technology users on how to effectively utilize that technology and that new method. It's not, a, it's not a short process. I think being constantly aware of the vulnerability state of your network is pivotal as well. Uh, but you, the use of pen tests are great, but they're a snapshot in time. If, whether you run them on a, a quarterly or a biennial or annual basis, they're still snapshots. And as soon as one bit of infrastructure, IT infrastructure gets a firmware update, changes the scope, 
it changes the architecture of um, of your network and it might introduce or highlight additional vulnerabilities which can be exploited the next day after the firmware update. So having a continuous vulnerability monitoring capability to identify any new uh, vulnerabilities as and when they become apparent so they can be mitigated or remediation uh, controls put in place. I, I think that's probably pivotal as well. I think it's, yeah, it's a component. I don't think it's a foolproof component. It, it, it very much depends... I don't think that there's anything that's foolproof when it comes to cybersecurity yeah. in a lot of ways. No, there isn't. There isn't. No matter which way you look at it, nothing is perfect. Um, you can put in all kinds of prevention in, but I don't know. It kind of goes hands in hand with this 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 um, European legislation change, really, because if they're going to start imposing a minimum requirement of a standard of security in a more laid out fashion, then not that it'll affect the UK because we're not part of the of Europe anymore. But again, depending upon who's providing the advisories, you, you, you could require a blanket level of, of protection. I mean, let's be honest. We had governments who, who were able to to convince people to lock themselves down for a year and a half or so, depending upon where you are in the world. So, you know, encryption shouldn't be too much of a problem. The price, will, the, the, the the main issue will be the price. I think the main thing where this will have a level of impact is is not necessarily when it reaches the EU, because as you say, Jim, we're not part of the EU. We don't have to listen to them anymore, um, regardless of what your perspectives are. Um, but when it reaches um, the UN level, so a, plan, a pan-global uh, organisation, I think when they take this up and start introducing regulations um, and limitations on what businesses can do, um, I think that's where, you know I mean, we'll, we'll start pricking our ears up a little bit, start paying a lot more attention um, because they will be the ones that are dictating what we can um, or should and should not be doing. They've already got regulations in place, certainly with the automotive industry, um, with with how the data should be controlled from the manufacturer down to a, an end user. Um, so they're, they're already starting to define how data should be stored, um, transmitted and utilised within certain frameworks. So, yeah, when it comes down to additional threat spectrums or, or threat actors, that they're going to start having that level of... Um, consideration and impact we're not looking at security in the right way in my opinion you know i said this in the podcast earlier on you know there was there was uh, we had a guest and he was saying we need more legislation and i said legislation with what you know because we've got legislation here for this legislation there for that we've got like sell for legal we've got pci dss if you take car payments but it's not legislation but compliance frameworks and so on and so forth and we've got it for manufacturing we've got it for car manufacturing we'll have it for iot we're going to have it for this that and the other you might have some firms that are trying trying to comply with like eight different types of legislation with yeah crossovers but not intrinsically linked And depending on what if you're multinational, what if the you know the EU sends out their legislation, and then the US sets out their legislation, and then I don't know, Germany, well, Europe, they are part of Europe. Um, I don't know, Australia, you know, sets out theirs. Again, you're going to have multiple versions of of you know. I I think. I don't really trust the legislators either because quite often you have people who don't know the subject matter legislating stuff that they don't know about. I mean, years ago, when I remember when the internet first became a bit of a point of concern when people started realising that content on the internet was not being regulated. You had some senior MPs and senior uh, figures saying, we need to regulate the internet. But they didn't understand it. Yeah. So they were making arbitrary decisions on something that wouldn't wouldn't work. 
But I think that's just politics, isn't it? Yeah, but look at cyber you know I mean? All that. It's, it's, it's nothing. They had to boil it down to the lowest possible common denominator to deal with the, the broadest base of businesses. But well, they, not- they had to allow the lowest common denominator to, to be able to achieve it. And well, they're going to have to do the same thing with this legislation, though. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Which means that whatever is introduced, whatever legislation is put into place, will be aimed at the lowest common denominator. So that means that those larger entities who have the ability to conform to better or certainly more mature frameworks, they won't be bound by it. So they'll still be the ones that are at higher risk and the more susceptible to these types of attacks. I just think we need a better joined up approach. I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in creating a think tank of different information security professionals from different areas of different businesses at different stages of career from those that have been around for 30, 40 years to those that are relatively new to, to come up with a universal guy, you know, a universal set of regulations that you need to meet that isn't set hard in stone, like thou shalt have encryption or thou shalt have this, that and the other, because different companies have different they're going to have different count measures depending upon what they do. No, I think you're right, Jim. Um, but also with, with that, you know, have, having a think tank with hypothetically 30, uh, 30 years worth of experience across the board, you're always going to have the old guard, new guard mentality or competitiveness. You are, but, but I think, you know, with the right kind of infosec people, and that will be the tough bit, um, we've got a pretty good idea of... of what needs to be done. And it'd be nice to be listened to for once, <laughs> once in the blue moon, I'll be honest. Um, we listen to you, Jim, sometimes. I know you guys do, because you have to. <laughs> I pay you to. Um, but, you know, when it comes to when it comes to, to, to Parliament, good example, you know, you hear them saying, you know, we need to raise our cybersecurity uh, capability here in the UK. Okay, how do you want to do it? Get more people with more stuff right well that's not you know that's not a open-ended random thing to say i mean you know why don't you just go uh, I, I think with the ever-evolving nature of cyber certainly cyber security with the introduction of new tools that are coming out being developed like to combat new threats government are always going to be five years behind the curve five uh, all right 15 um, years behind the curve and and that's one of the struggles they have and it's certainly something that I, I saw um, in my tenure working uh, for one of the organizations um, is that and anything new that we were trying to introduce it was always something that was a year to five years behind of um, like commercial industry or anything any new solution we're bringing in, it was always outdated. So when you're trying to look at additional support moving forwards or new products to, to supplement the, the infrastructure or device that you've got, they're already outdated because industry's moved on. So, and then it's, it's just an endless void of, of funds that you're trying to put into it just to keep a capability that went out of date like 10 years before. Um, I think that's where they're going to struggle because they're going to try and define legislation on the threats as they understand it now so it's from a like, capture point in time, but when it's introduced, that's my it's point, five years out of date. As they understand it and they don't. Yeah. They they will no doubt have their, their people who will be advising them, but are those people infosec people or are they IT people with a bit of knowledge of infosec? Because you'll get two what's their mentalities? Yeah, I mean, if, if you're working for a lucrative um, governmental organisation, then you're going to want to sweet talk things and put things in a nice pink and fluffy language rather than actually coming out with a down and dirty of this is actually what the standard is. This is realism. This is life. And this is what you're up against. So, you know what I mean, this is black and white. 
there's a hell of a lot of grey that's introduced in it. Yeah, I think I think Tom's got the right idea. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily the experts. It could be the experts that they're bringing in and the people that they may not know their, their subject matter as well as they'd hope or whatever the case may be. Or maybe the UK government's just buying the cheapest, but, uh, you know, the cheapest advice that they can. But even if those people are actual experts, I mean, for example, let's say, Jim, you are the top expert on a subject matter, let's say ransomware, just because we're talking about it. And the UK government actually approaches you and you go, finally, I've got, I've got the opportunity to um, actually make a difference here, right? But then yeah. they take your advice, they get it all written up, and then it's the cogs that are slow after that. So the yeah. UK government may may be getting the right advice, but as Tom says, by the time, you know, they might have the right people giving them excellent advice and everything, but by the time that they make that into legislation or pushing it out or advising or whatever the case may be, because of the slow churn and the slow cog turn, that when it does come out, it's pointless or not necessarily completely pointless, but mostly pointless or out of date or whatever the case may be. No longer fit for purpose. I think it. I, I think it's, you know, symptomatic. And this is why I think, you know, I don't want to blow smoke up our own asses, but this is why this is, this kind, these kinds of conversations are important. So something happens and we can go, well, right, yeah, this has happened. Here's a conversation about it, and this is what we advise. This is what we, as professionals, getting it out there and getting, you know, getting the message out there. This is what we need to do. I think every time we discuss this, we're going, you know, we're going down further rabbit holes. We're discovering, yeah. and you know, with it's it's a. Uh, we're in flux at the moment. The industry is in flux. We've got more tools than we know what to do with. More tools coming out all over the place. Companies are buying up cybersecurity companies like Bilio. Yeah, and they're investing. Other companies are investing heavily in cybersecurity at the moment. So all of these kind of new vendors, new solutions are cropping up, having tons of investment flown at them. But the problem is, is it's all tooling. <laughs> A lot of it is tooling. You, 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 you know, you need to have like InfoSec people looking objectively at the organization from the top down, from a technological people sense, of, from all kinds of different levels, um, and determining what that defense in depth looks like because every organization is different, you know, and if you're going to do awareness programs, good example, you have to weave that in with the culture of the organization and the culture of an organization, say, like, I don't know, Google, where you've got rest areas and yoga areas and, you know, meeting rooms where you can go for a kip in a pod and get rejuvenated to 20 years old. Um, it's going to be very different from, you know, a large accountant in the middle of, middle of London where, you know, it, it's crunch time. It's, Someone it's sat like, over there with a whip, just like Jim does to us, Tom. Absolutely. Yeah, well, right I can't old. possibly comment on that. Certainly not on a, uh, a streamed platform. But, uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, uh, we still have to keep having the discussions. We still have to keep looking at what's going on. And we have to try to keep as vocal as possible to, to let people know. And that's not when I say us. I mean us at Razorthorn. I mean us as a community, as a security community working together to kind of try to deliver the right advisory at the right level. You, you posited, you know, I would love a chance to to assist the UK government in one aspect of, of InfoSec. But equally, my first piece of advisory would be don't, don't, you know, let me build a team of, say, six or seven people of peers of mine who know this subject matter from different angles put us in a room together for a day or two or maybe a week or however long, supply us with coffee and maybe beer from your parliament, you know, parliamentary bar and uh, we'll come up with, with, with a couple of options for you or a couple of viable, bio, viable methods. I wouldn't do it on my own. And, I, you know, I, I'd want to get 
you know, the ability to bounce ideas off different people. So, yeah, I don't, I don't see any other way of dealing with it. You know, um, you can't deal with it all technologically from a legislative point of view or from a ransomware point of view. You know, let's use those two main items because we've been talking about them. I think one of the most important things is is building a relationship within your organization, whether you have dedicated or employed InfoSec personnel and professionals, whether it be a team, whether it just be a, a lone CISO that, that, that obviously oversees all your, your processes and accreditations, um, or whether you utilize a, an external consultancy organization. Uh, I think maintaining a, a strong working relationship with, with those entities where certainly the C-suite or the board members, they, they listen to the things that are being said to them um, and then take that forward because as soon as the board level or C-suite are deaf to things that are being rated them from their infosec professionals, then that's game over, right, pure and simple. Um, and yes, security infosec, it's, it's never been the flavor of the month for a lot of um a lot of individuals, uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a harsh reality. You need InfoSec. You need accreditation, depending on your organizational need. Um, but there are threats out there. There are risks and there are controllable uh, mitigations that you can put into place to minimize that risk. But risk, there, all, there will always be. Um, Jim, obviously, we, we dealt with a, an incident last week with, with, with one of our clients. And... To be honest, the, uh, the output was what they were subject to. They couldn't have avoided because it was a complete random act. But yeah, you know I mean, we we um, we reacted to it and we provided some information uh, or some remedial guidance on what they should do after it. But they were always at risk that that might happen. Well, it wasn't random. It was very very targeted. In all honesty, it's just the methodology that they used. It was as, it was going to provide a scattergun approach, admittedly, to, to what they were trying to achieve. But um, you know, the, the and there was no real compromise, and that's always the difficult one. Where mm. you know somebody has set up a uh, you know stolen basically your identity and is running it completely independent of you and what you have access to. You know, with their own email address and all the rest of it. Um, there's not literally not a massive amount you can do. You can report it. You can kind of take some action, but you're kind of reliant on the security processes of those those companies that you've contacted. And unfortunately, they're not always the greatest, you know, and they're not always the most speedy either. That's where education and training comes in, though, is to inform and educate your staff that if you do get something that is of a suspicious nature, don't click it to investigate yourself. Flag it. Yeah, pass it off. That's a that's a a preventative measure that you can take. You can take, but it it's not. People will, yeah. People always have. Well, they won't think. You know, they'll just go. Oh, stop randomly clicking around things. Maybe they're busy. Maybe they're up at you know ridiculous o'clock in the morning. Maybe they're you know in the middle of doing something and you know don't think and just click on stuff. Um, well, there always are the security measures to take place, like segmentation, you know, segmentating networks or authentication or access controls. Again, you know, there's tons of things you can do. Really good countermeasures. They're all fantastic, but they tend to be the, for the larger organizations. You, you're not going to get a small kind of 10-man business doing, you know, that kind of level of segmentation unless they were, you know, actively building something in that space because you just won't have the money to do it. You know, a good firewall will set you back quite a few grand. Then you've got your um, two-factor authentication, which will set you back a few quid. Um, you know, <laughs> layer defense is the way to go, but, you know, tooling is just one aspect of that layer. You need to you need to consider the others. And I think, I don't know, we're at a dangerous time where we could get legislated into an area that, that isn't possible for us to to meet. You know, because somebody told them that, that that everybody could. You know, there's been plenty of, dare I say it, slightly ridiculous laws over the years um, that still haven't been repealed. I mean, some parts of the UK can still shoot a Welshman with a longbow on a Sunday or something, you know. 
family being Welsh, I don't like that idea. But this but, is where the NCSC is going to prove pivotal in their advice and guidance to uh, to Parliament in the enaction of these legislations. But then it's still reliant on the NCSC, the NCSC is still reliant on the small, smaller, even medium and large organisation to feed in that level of um, that guidance on, on of obviously what they need or what they believe would be, it's not about fairness, but what they believe they can achieve or the restrictions that they believe that they can continue under from a legislative point of view. Um, so the, the NCSC have got their work cut out for them on this because it won't just be obviously you know, a, an independent um, governing body that's formed it from Parliament. They'll, they'll be working with the NCSC and the NCSC yeah, will then obviously work with... I'm not being funny or anything, but, you, you know... <sighs> They're very underpaid. They're they're you know they're usually trained into that role, and they've only ever known any you know stuff within that role. I'm sure they're very good and all the rest. I'm not 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 you know cutting them down or 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 whatever. But you've got to get a broad view. One of the big one of the big aspects and one of the things I like about security people is you get them together and you pose them a you know pose them a a problem. And they will come up with some really interesting ways of fixing it. And, and it tends to be quite a nice community to work in. Okay, yeah, we've got people with egos. And we've got a few people who, who you know, annoy the hell out of a lot of people. But as a general rule, you know, when we're all sitting there working together, we've, we've all had the same experience of a certain level of apathy when it comes to security historically, especially if you're, you've been in the game for over 10 years. And for the first time in history, people are actually starting to see the, the value of security. But we, we need to be very careful how we deal with this. On one side, we need to pick, you know, we need to pick the right people. Dare I say it, it sounds horrible, doesn't it? But the right people to sit there and go, right, so government guys, what are you, what information have you got? Old school commercial guys, what have you seen in the commercial, what's possible in the commercial world? You have worked in the commercial world, so you know what, what the general consensus is and what's possible and what isn't. Because somebody in, in government, they've never, you know, more often than not, they've never worked in the commercial world. They've, they've been in the civil service for a long time to get to that position. And it's a different universe. It's, it's very different. As you experienced, Tom, you know, moving from, from the forces into, 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 the commercial world. I mean, admittedly, you had the massive luck of joining us, but uh, still, so, uh, like the balance of that luck is kind of resting. But uh, neither do I at the moment. But that's that's why we have Michael's. I, I'll, I'll look forward to my six month review. I think we've discussed two specific big points. I mean, we could go all day long discussing a number of mm. other things, but. You know, I think the, the two biggest points there are watch this space and find out what happens with ransomware in the UK, in the US, you know, globally. Because I think once one person or one one nation makes a rule, we'll probably start to see that rule echo out a bit. Um, same with G look at GDPR, you know, the UK's left Europe. And when GDPR came out, we said, right, gonna, you know, we're going to conform to GDPR. Because all the work has already been done for it, and there was no reason to reinvent the wheel, um, you know, for right or wrong. Um, and I think it's going to be the same for this legislation as well. It will be interesting to see where it takes us. Um, but again, I'll, I'll echo the sentiment that I think whatever is introduced legislatively will be two, three years uh, too late. I say too late, I mean, anything introduced will have an effect, it will have value, um, but it'll be out of date. Michael, thoughts? You have, rem you have remained remarkably silent whilst... whilst yes, we have I, th I think I've spoken like five sentences or something. <laughs> That's all right, you're a, you're a man of few words, but much wisdom. Well, seeing that we're closing up very soon anyways, you know. First, preventative measures, at least encryption, you know, and backups... And encrypt the backups too. <laughs> very wise, you know. Yeah, in a separate, there, you know, <laughs> with separate encryption keys. Yeah, uh, and from... if you can afford it, implement some other security measures as well. <laughs> you know, get a you know cyber cyber security business like us. You know, to assess your infrastructure. You know, pick me. I'm good at it. <laughs> 
Tom's all right. You could just <laughs> that hear that head rapidly wow. expanding <laughs> from that apartment. But yeah, no, I think I think watch this space. I think it's going to be it's going to be interesting. We've got a number of podcasts where we're putting in a lot of different people from a lot of different locations that might be able to add to this narrative. And I think this is going to be a narrative that we're going to probably find continuing on with, you know, our monthly chats, you know, and our monthly kind of info dumps um, for, for a little while yet until, you know, we've got some clear courses of action where, because I mean, it's, it's all still up in the arms at the moment with, with that legislation. It's still going to take ages to sort of work it out and figure out what they, they want it to look like. And then, God help us implementing implementing it and voting on it to to make make it go into law. I mean that's that can take ages in itself. And in the meantime, us security people just keep plugging away with what we've got: five pounds and a pickled egg, and you know if we're lucky, a firewall. Um, you know, we'll try and secure the environment. But um, thank you ever so much for listening to to uh, to us ramble on about current events. Uh, if you have any questions or you have anything that you want to kind of want us to cover or even argue over, because we like a good argument here, then uh, drop it in the comments. In the meantime, guys and girls, look after yourselves, stay cool, and uh, stay safe is probably the best way to do it. And, and watch out for that ransomware because it's getting bad out there. Speak to you soon. Bye. <laughs>